Hello everyone. Um, if I haven't met you before, um, my name is Tal Keston. I am the Network Manager for the Sustainable Development Solutions Network or SDSN in Australia, New Zealand and Pacific and based at Monash University. And I'd like to add um, my uh, excitement to be having this workshop with all of you today from really across the region. Um, it's been a long time in planning um, because this is um, really a topic that all three of our organisations have considered really important and wanted to do something fairly big on. And it's taken a long time to shape it and plan it and get it up, particularly over the last year. So um, really, as, as we're saying, the topic is really how we can accelerate education for the Sustainable Development Goals by higher education institutions in our region. And we define education for the SDGs as providing learners with the knowledge, skills and mindsets to contribute to solving the world's complex sustainable development challenges and achieving the SDGs through whichever profession or path they choose in life. Um, this is something that we believe is really relevant to all learners. And to me, this really came home when I looked at, I'm still looking at how the world is reacting to the climate emergency and, and COVID. Um, and I particularly consider higher education institutions to have a really key role in this, um, both because we have an enormous reach in terms of learners and because we're really uniquely placed in providing professional and lifelong education. But while there are pockets of really fantastic work on this in our region, we all believe that there's a lot more that needs to be done and really done urgently because with the way things are going in the world, we can't wait um, for another 10 years before we have everyone on board to help with addressing the SDGs and climate change. But this is really not an easy task. Um, there are a lot of barriers and challenges that higher education institutions and all of us as, um, as educators and people who are supporting this, who um, we need to overcome. And so we wanted to try and bring everyone together, connect interested stakeholders from across the region, which we don't think has happened for at least quite a long time and try and work on this together. So strength in uh, bringing everyone's ideas and enthusiasm and experience together. But this is a really huge topic. Um, we only have four hours. And as we're putting the program together and hearing what's happening around the, the country and the region, we realize that there's only, we can really only touch a little bit on a variety of topics. So we really see this as a place to get started. So really to start connecting together as a community, to start having a conversation, to start hearing what is going on around the region, what are exciting things that people are doing, to start getting ideas on how we might work together um, going forward. So the way the workshop will work um, is that today we'll focus particularly on setting the scene. So why are we actually here? And why are we trying to do what we're doing? And then look at how, what does education and SD, for the SDGs actually look like in the classroom or in teaching in the curriculum? And we'll have um, both some really great speakers as well as some interactive activities for all of us. Tomorrow we'll focus more on how we address education for the SDGs from an institutional perspective, because as far as I'm concerned, this is what is really needed to accelerate action on a much larger scale. And um, our final session will be a brainstorming session on how we can work together on that. And also, I want at this point to thank um, an advisory group of experts who really helped us to shape how we approach this workshop, how ambitious to be or, or where to start, and who are really also helping with running the workshop today. So let's get started. And I'm going to pass now to Belinda, who will be chairing the next little panel. Thanks, Tal. 
Thanks guys. So our first session today uh, builds on the case for higher education institutions in our region to ramp up education for the SDGs. And we are so fortunate to have two panelists um, with extensive knowledge of how demand and thinking in this area is shifting uh, globally across all sectors. So can I please introduce um, Giselle Waybright? I don't know, Giselle, you've got your camera on there. Um, author and advisor in sustainability management and education and Professor Rod Glover, who is um, Professor of Policy and Management for Monash Sustainable Development Institute uh, within Monash University. So both panelists will present to us today um, why they think now is the right time for our higher education institutions uh, in our region to ramp up education for the sustainable development goals for all students. So Giselle will be taking a business or business school perspective and Rod will be um, uh, taking a policy making perspective. Um, Re is going to pop also a Menti link in our chat and that will allow you to actually engage during the presentations by posting um, your answer to that question. Um, and we'll take a quick look at that at that Menti um, slide after the panelists give their, their perspective on this issue. Uh, so yeah, well, let's kick it off. And Giselle, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. It's so lovely to see you. <laughs> turn my video off, but I'll turn it back on as it, we get close to the five minute mark and, and wave you off the stage. Thanks, That's Giselle. Good. <laughs> good morning, everybody from sunny Perth. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, today is the first day of pre-primary, so I get a nice quiet office to speak to you all from, which is really exciting for me. So I'm glad that I get to share this moment of quiet with you, at least for the next five minutes. But here we go. Um, I think that it's safe to say that we all know that now and every day since 2015 has been the right time for higher education institutions everywhere, but in particular in our region to ramp up uh, for education for the SDGs for all of our students. We're really lucky here because compared to most countries, I'd say, especially in terms of business schools, we're further along in the journey to say to embed sustainability and the SDGs more broadly into everything that we're doing as a university and as a school. However, we still have a long ways to go. We have a lot of really interesting approaches in this region, many of which we're going to hear about over the next couple of days, but they're only scratching the surface of what's still possible. And that's what makes the SDG so exciting to me. It's about the opportunities that it can present for business education in particular to reevaluate how effective it truly is at preparing the next generation of leaders. Sustainability has always been seen as something separate in business education, but the SDGs are different. It's this commonly agreed upon roadmap, a cheat sheet, so to say, of what we all need to know and act on. It's already being used and acted upon by governments, by NGOs, by companies, and all the organizations that business schools uh, work with and prepare students to work for. So one of the things that I've been working on last year is I went through all of the sustainability reports that were written by signatories of the UN Principles for Responsible Management Education and a lot of the signatories are here today with us. And I looked at the reports that were submitted since 2015 when the SDGs were launched until 2020. And it was really interesting to look at because I want, what I wanted to know is I wanted to see what kind of awareness schools had around the SDGs and what approaches they were taking in terms of what they were doing around the SDGs. And I was really surprised that the vast majority of the business schools that were reporting were not mentioning the SDGs. And if they did, we're really mentioning them in passing. Now, I'm very proud to say as a pretend wannabe Australian, because I know my accent gives me away, uh, that this isn't so much an issue here. Most of the schools here are engaging the SDGs in some way, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more that we can do. Because a lot of the schools here have passed this awareness stage where everybody is aware of what the SDGs are or should be hopefully by now. Um, but that's when the real work needs to start. So I have five quick messages that I wanted to share based on some of my findings. And the first is that, uh, awareness raising about the SDGs is important, but we really can't stop there. Your role as a school isn't necessarily to help st students to understand how they can save water at home per se, it's to ensure that they understand how this connects to their future careers, to marketing, to finance, to operations, to HR, et cetera. Uh, we can't leave that job to a sustainability or an ethics class. This has nothing to do with sustainability, it has to do with business and, and it has to. Second, we throw this term walking the talk around a lot, but very few schools are actually walking the talk. We need to engage our staff more in ensuring that as business, as, as a business, as an institution, you're also doing your part in relation to the SDGs. 
Hardly any of the schools seem to be engaging their students at a strategic level in relation to the SDGs, and this is a huge missed opportunity. Third, we need to make sure we're actually reaching students. A lot of reports, a lot of schools have these impressive lists of initiatives that relate to the SDGs, but it's generally unclear how many students have access to these or are part of these initiatives or exactly how the SDGs are being approached within these initiatives. Most seem to be voluntary and aimed at small subsections of students or they're not connected with the core curriculum. So that's very important to recognize as well. Fourth, well, it's important, of course, that we start small where we can, even though it's harder to justify that five years into the SDGs, but we'll put that aside for now. Uh, the goal really needs to embed this, is to embed this throughout. Most schools have a lot of individual initiatives that relate to the SDGs, but this isn't fundamentally influencing staff, faculty, or students, or what a business school does and how it does it. And last but not least, fifth is, if now isn't the time, then when? I feel like the SDGs are the special pass that we've been given to finally convince everyone in our institutions that this is crucial. Uh, it's an increasingly important part of the strategies of the organizations that we work for and that our graduates go to work for. And we really can't, can we say that we're preparing students for, for in the world as it is today and we want it to be tomorrow if we're not including the SDGs? Uh, because you know we're not really fulfilling our role in terms of SDG 4 and quality education if we're not including uh, the SDGs. And just to finish off, because I'm probably almost at my five minute mark, I think most organizations don't realize that without the active engagement of higher educational institutions, we won't be able to reach the SDGs. We all have this responsibility to our students, but also to our communities to ensure that we're preparing them fully to give them a true picture of what business is or should be or can be. And that's why I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the other approaches that uh, the schools in this region are working on over the next couple of days. Thank you so much, Belinda. Thanks so much, Giselle. Four minutes, 55. How's that? <laughs> Perfect, perfect. You're under pressure now, Rod. <laughs> Thank you so much for those perspectives, especially being from a business faculty. They um, very much touch home. Um, Rod, I'm going to pass the floor over to you just to get your yeah policy perspective. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Glenda. Uh, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with so many like-minded people interested in this conversation. Um, I work a lot with policymakers and politicians, public servants and politicians, and I'll just share, I guess, a little bit of context about what I'm picking up about what's changed in the COVID context in the SDG conversation. First of all, I think it's really important to draw out aspects of COVID that really are relevant here. And I think in particular, COVID has highlighted the inter interdependence across systems and geographies and societies. Uh, it's, it, we've seen actors in government behave in unconventional ways. They've spotted and acted on linkages, uh, whereas they might have previously been in their silos. They're collaborating with people they've not had to collaborate with before. They're drawing on expertise, evidence and data in new ways. And interestingly, they're, they're having to solve problems quickly in a way that they don't always have to in the normal course of government and policy. So they're really exposed to decision-making under, under uncertainty uh, in a new way. I also though want to kind of note a bit of caution because a lot of conversation around why can't we do for climate what we're doing for COVID. And I think it's really important to draw out some of the differences between a disruptive crisis and a creeping crisis. So the, the big dis distinction I think about COVID is there's an urgency and a fast thinking that's, and fast action that's required of it that is characteristically different to some of the long-term sustainability challenges that we face. So challenges like climate change and declining biodiversity, um, inequality, insecure work, uh, democracy itself, they're challenges that don't necessarily get acted upon. And in fact, what we've seen is it's quite possible for those challenges to remain unaddressed for a long period of time, to never get the sense of urgency or government attention that demand that they're addressed properly. And that's very different. That's an aspect of creeping crisis that's quite different to a disruptive crisis. And I think it's easy to sort of miss that. Uh, is it time for the SDGs? I'm not sure it's time for the SDGs, to be really honest, because I think the SDGs, despite we've got Glasgow this year, we've got a 2030 timeframe, we've got a new Biden administration. We've also got governments that are going to have lots of other priorities 
uh, whether it's health or economic priorities, uh, security challenges, uh, safety challenges more broadly. So I don't think we can take it as a given that this is a point in time in which we're all going to step back and look at the big picture again, because in fact, there's a whole constituency that just wants things to go back to normal. And some of that constituency comprises governments themselves. I think what it is time for though, very clearly is what I would term SDG thinking. And I think one of the things that uh, SDGs are really powerful for is they encourage us to take one step back, to take a wider view and to take a longer view. And when we do that, we really get the big picture understanding and we can start to see capabilities for SDG thinking as actually capabilities for practical problem solving, for public problem solving. And what we're going to need going forward, whether it's in government or out of government, whether in business or civil society or ordinary citizens, is I think a new generation, a new movement of practical problem solvers, of both leaders and change makers working at different scales and in different places that are going to have to push us forward, whether it's from inside power positions or outside power positions towards tackling some of these long entrenched uh, challenges. I think it's really important to also uh, kind of have a sense of what Asai Berlin terms a sense of reality. Uh, and that's really kind of being quite hard about that question of what's the most important thing that we can do now and making sure we make those gains wherever we can, while also holding the space for the larger conversations and thinking creatively about the things that we can't address uh, immediately, but we have to actually shift a public conversation to be able to address over time. It's, you know, often we kind of would love to just jump into this space and say, let's create the perfect future we would want without actually a real recognition that there are boundaries on that. And there are political boundaries on that for, for other actors that are central to that challenge as well, which I think we should recognise. Uh, finally, I just want to sort of say that I think that there's, even though there's a great appetite from within government for people to better understand how systems relate and interact, I don't think this is a given by any means that we're going to pull this off, that we're going to achieve what we need to achieve under the Sustainable Development Goals. And the reason for that is there's a great political contest still in the background, uh, and it's a political and a cultural contest uh, where not everyone is actually on board with our agenda. I agree that the SDGs carry an enormous authority having been agreed by all, all, all governments, uh, but that doesn't mean it translates into the policy agendas of all governments automatically. And if there's one thing that we've seen over the last 12 months, it's the incredible, incredible bifurcation we've seen and the polarisation that we've seen in the debate that I think is a real risk. And I think in one sense, uh, what is going to be really important for leaders going forward is going to be that ability to hold together different communities hold together and, and give a stake to communities that want to achieve the larger change and the social movements that will back that up, but also make sure we're hearing the voices and giving a stake of those that are not on board for change yet. Uh, because it's whoever's gonna hold that uh, coalition together that's actually going to make practical progress. So I might just leave it there on a note of uh, slightly cautious optimism. Thanks for that, Rod. I always love it when we have a policy maker in the room. <laughs> thank you, thank you so, so much for those for those insights. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting when you mentioned the word, you know, not everyone on board. And I think that's really pertinent for us in as, as academics in higher education and how important more so that makes it for us to be discussing this in our classrooms. Um, because they are the ones that are moving into our workforce and our future leaders. So I think there's some really great points there. Um, I was wondering, Rhi, if you could um, share the screen with the live mentee board. Um, I know some of you are having some, some chats, there's some really interesting chats, but um, Rhi's just sharing the, the screen there with some of your comments on there. Um, I know we're probably nearly at time, but it'd be really interesting um, as my puppy helps me with this conversation. Um, that, yeah, just have a look at the points coming up there for a minute. And I was just wondering if our speakers saw any that they, they, that really impacted them or that they thought were really quite interesting that they wanted to reflect on. Uh, so Belinda, one that really jumps out at me is thinking about the question of what's the unique role of higher education institutions. Mm. Uh, and, and you touched on it in that point of, um, 
you know, you're developing a capability set and a mindset amongst the next generation of leaders and change makers. And that to me is a massive leverage point for long-term change. Um, and, you know, interestingly, the skills that you need for that are skills that you're going to need for the jobs of the future, not just the challenges of the future. Thanks for that, Rod. Giselda, any stand out there for you or any? Yeah, I was looking at some of the ones about, you know, how COVID is the priority, not the SDGs. And I actually find it interesting now, there's a lot of discussions we can have around issues within the SDGs that are coming forwards because of COVID, like mental health. Um, you know, and here in WA, they're pushing uh, planning decisions forward really quickly without very much consultation. And that has a huge impact on the community as well and on the SDGs. So there's actually a lot of different kinds of discussions we can have about the SDGs because of COVID that are coming up because of COVID, which, which makes COVID, I mean, COVID is not good, but it makes it interesting, an interesting situation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank, thanks for those thoughts. Um, please, everyone, obviously, again, as Ree mentioned, we will share these, these comments and thoughts with everyone um, after the, the workshops. Please thank um, Giselle and Rod for me. We can do a bit of a bit of an e-clap um, for them. That would be that would be really lovely. Uh, thank you so so much. And we yeah we look forward to you. Hopefully you're able to, to hang around and listen to to our next set of, of speakers. I'm now going to hand over um, the next session to Associate Professor uh, Jeannie Ray. Welcome, Jeannie. Jeannie is the Senior Project Manager um, for Planetary Health and course chair graduate certificate in planetary health at Victoria University. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Jeannie. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Belinda. And thank you to our great starting off key keynote comments there from Giselle and Rod. And thank you to Tal and everybody that has organised this for us. There's a lot of us on here uh, today, and it certainly does show that um, there's a lot of us out there keen and doing this sort of this sort of work so while we're looking at the issues of barriers and challenges remember there's all of us here doing it and all the people that couldn't be with us today i wish to start by acknowledging that i'm on Boonwurrung land i'm in not not on my university campus as you can probably see behind me clearly working from home and i ought to acknowledge and pay respect to the elders, past, present, and to emerging leaders. And to also, also recognise Aboriginal sovereignty and that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I also want to pay respects to all First Nations people joining us today from within Australia and beyond. Um, Victoria University has made a all of university commitment to planetary health. And so I also just wanted to add something that we're now including in, in our acknowledgements, um, referring to that as part of that commitment. And what we're saying is that indigenous communities have been planetary health custodians for more than 50,000 years, caring and advocating for the well-being of people, place and planet, and understanding the unbreakable link between these elements in determining our future. Now we've got the really exciting session now where we've got four people who are going to tell us actually what's going on in the classroom. We could probably start and get uh, go down the path of what actually is our classroom and um, I suspect that they may touch on that as well. So our purpose here is to try and explore different approaches from across the region of how we're going about integrating SDGs into our teaching and hopefully we'll learn something from the ways that uh, others are doing it. After we've heard from our speakers, we'll be um, then having an interactive brainstorming activity. So there will be an opportunity for other participants to become involved later in the, later in the session today. For the speakers we've got to get us started off, uh, um, Marin Najati, Dr. Marin Najati, who's a senior lecturer and director of Prime and Sustainability in the School of Business and Law at Edith Cowan. We've got Dr. Sam Leonard, who's a senior lecturer and the Masters in SDGs program coordinator at Massey University in New Zealand for those Australians who are thinking which one's Massey. 
Um, to Priya Sharma, who's a lecturer and prime ambassador in the Department of Business Law and Taxation in the School of Business at Monash, Malaysia. Welcome, Priya. And Giselle, who you've already been introduced to, um, who is also going to speak about what general, generally what business schools are doing. So the setup is that I'm going to ask each an initial question of the panelists, and then we're going to uh, move into conversational mode for a little while. And then, as I said, we'll open it up for an interactive activity so all can engage in. So my starting question is, how do you actually interpret education for the SDGs and how are you integrating that into your teaching for yourself and of course, amongst your colleagues? Moran, do you want to get started? Sure, thanks, Jenny. Um, I think uh, in, before I start, I, I wanted to reframe that question a little bit because for me, I think education doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to classroom and it, go, it can even go beyond that. And one example that in particular I wanted to share with the audience today was uh, an initiative that we have been conducting here in WA in collaboration with uh, all of the prime signatories. And this um, collaboration was something around, uh, uh, you know, involving students in teams to be thinking about SDGs, to identify some of the problems around that. and considering some of the ways that they could be finding a solution to that in consultation with the people or the stakeholders which are mostly affected uh, by that. Um, I can go into more details around that, but just briefly around this topic, I think one of the things that we have noticed is uh, through bringing in industry representatives, local governments, uh, you know, representatives from academia and community, we managed to create a, you know, a good platform for dialogue, discussion, and critical thinking so that the students could be looking at innovative ways of addressing some of these most promising uh, and most uh, significant issues around SDGs. Um, this particular initiative that I was mentioning involved uh, 53 students in particular from various universities across WA, including UWA, Curtin University, Murdoch University, and Edith Cowan University. They formed 11 teams working uh, among uh, different universities. So they, they were sort of collaborating with the students from other universities, some who ha whom they had never met before. And they chose a specific SDGs, uh, tried to look for solutions to that. And all of these uh, ideas were then judged by a panel of independent judges coming from industry and local government. Uh, and uh, this was happening throughout the month of September and October. So it was uh, a rather, um, I guess, a learning process that occurred over two months. And uh, we had very positive feedback from that. Thanks very much, Marat. And I think that's really it, a really important point that we may um, pursue hopefully a bit further too is about the participation of students and indeed empowering students and um, giving students agency in their own education. So we'll might hold on that one and come back to it. Thank you. Um, Sam, would you like to pick up now? Yes, great. So uh, I looked at the question and I thought to myself, well, what's the one thing that I can share in five minutes in terms of what um, I'm involved in and what Massey's doing? So for me, I think that... Um, do I interpret education for the SDGs? Well, the one thing that I'd like to talk about is that it must be interdisciplinary. It must be across the disciplines. It can't, they can't, it can't fit into one specific silo. We have to, you know, break down the silos and work together. Um, and how is, is Massey University doing that? Well, what they did, and I say they because it was set up before I got there, but um, what they did is they've set up a master's program of the sustainable development goals. So it's very specifically, obviously, um, focused on that. And the interesting thing about that, well, interesting for most people, it's often a headache for me, but still great, is that we've man they've managed we've managed to set up a degree that that ex that extends beyond the various colleges or faculties or disciplines, however your university labels them. So for example, we so we now have a degree where there's the core courses, the one core course which is housed within my college, which is social sciences. Um, so there's two core courses on the on sustainability and then a specific course on um, 
the SDGs in practice, which is very practically based. Um, and we, it's very much, it's, it's, it's less theoretical and, and geared towards future professionals working in the SDGs. And then the students get to choose different specializations. So at the moment, we've got four different specializations, um, which extend, so we've got one from the sciences, which is environmental science, uh, students can then specialize in business sciences, or they can go across to psychology, which is disaster management, or in the social sciences, global development. And then in the current, in the next year, we are adding two more, which is the one is going to be on um, economics. That's been interesting. You can just imagine the conversation with the economics department when we had to agree on the kind of content that they would be teaching, but, it, but it's great. And another specialization on peace and security, and the following year, we're going to be looking at education and global health. And why do I say all of this? Because I think what's interesting and about what this program has to share that's into this current conversation that's so interesting is that it's about trying to bring different disciplines together and giving students access to a range of um, or a range of students who are all coming from different disciplines. So you can imagine the conversations that we have in our core courses and the interaction between the students. Um, some of the things that have really worked is that a student can come into the program who doesn't, for example, doesn't have a background in business, but they can still do the business sustainability specialization, or they can still do environmental. So, for example, one of our students last year had done an undergraduate in law, and then she came and she did the MSDGs. And so she did her core courses and then her specialization was in environmental sciences. And so now she's able to go out there and she's got a bit of, and she understands both law and the environmental science and how the two, you know, link together with specifically within the framework of the SDGs. Um, so that's been great. We've had a lot of students who have come in because they want to actually, you know, broaden um, their, their, the, the disciplines that they're able to work in. And they wouldn't be able to, you know, for example, that student, she wouldn't have been able to go into a normal environmental postgrad type um, course because she didn't have the undergraduates. So that's worked really well. Um, from a logistical point, it's been, it's a bit of a nightmare for myself, I will be honest. And that's definitely something that has, that I think is going to come up in future conversations about how do we actually get um, cross-discipline or cross-college uh, programs to work because it is essential to the SDGs. You know, it cannot be a siloed approach. It must be inter it must be an interaction across the various subjects. And so that's been a challenge, but it is something that I'm overcoming every day. And um, and I think it definitely has great potential for the future. And then the last thing just to add to that is that what we've also done is um, within the, the program, within their chosen specializations, all students have to do a 60 credit research work with, and research practicum where they actually work in an organization um, and then they write up research about that. And, um, and just, you know, adding to the interdisciplinary aspect of it is that being able to take what they've learned in theory and then apply it in the real world and, you know, critically look at the link between how, between theory and the real world and how do we actually apply the knowledge we've learned um, in a in a prop, you know in a real world problem setting, so that's something that Massey is doing, and I think the most important thing that we have to add to the conversation at the moment is how to um, you know, how to get into college, interdiscipline type of approaches to education for the SDGs. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, I, I got really excited about the course and the way that it's evolving and adding specialisations, just listening to you. Um, it's a headache, but it's great. <laughs> I, I know the space and it's brilliant. Um, it's constantly exciting, even if exhausting. I think one of the things we may come back to in, in conversation too is some of the issues for us around the breaking down the silos, as we like to phrase it, and some of the concerns around, I suppose, disciplinary um, knowledge and, um, and definition, particularly with all the change that is constantly going on in our universities as well. So hold that, hold that one with you for a bit and let's um, move over to now hear from Priya from Malaysia talking about the integration into the business curriculum in a virtual environment. Hi, Priya. Hi, Jeannie. Thank you. Um, Sorry, let me just switch on my video. 
<laughs> Hi, um, thank you for that. I do think that education is one of the bed bedrocks of the SDGs. And uh, one way to integrate the SDGs into the classroom teaching and learning is to bridge the gap between um, higher education and the industry. So um, as a prime initiative in, in 2019, I developed a capstone unit, a multidisciplinary unit called Ethics and Sustainability in a Business Environment, launched for the first time in semester two last year. So its aim is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the importance of ethics and sustainability and the SDGs in a business environment. And it examines environmental, social, and governance issues by applying ethical theories, legislative, and the SDG framework. My intention was to bring the SDGs into the classroom by engaging students in a learning environment that has strong links with businesses and the industry. However, 2020 changed the landscape with the higher education stepping fully online and the world going into lockdown, it became a challenge to engage with stakeholders. So I had to think of creative ways to accomplish this in a virtual platform. So um, to achieve the learning outcomes um, of this unit, I developed uh, the following assessments and created the virtual responsible education series. So the first assessment was a research assignment where students were required to evaluate the differences between social enterprises and corporations in delivering um, social change under the SDGs. So two virtual workshops for a duration of one and a half, half hours were conducted by a Malaysian social enterprise, Marika and Deloitte Corporation. So opportunity was created here for interactive engagement and participation in a virtual platform and students use this platform and the recordings effectively to help them in this research assignment. And in following through for the feedback, I sent sample assignments to Marika and Deloitte um, senior management for their input. So the comments provided uh, were unique and impactful as it allowed students to appreciate practical insights from within the organizations over and above the usual academic feedback. So in the second assessment in groups, students were required to do group presentations during online tutorials on cases around the world relating to SDG issues. They were required to identify environment, um, economic, social issues, evaluate the relevant theories and frameworks and apply them to the issues concerned. So the presentation then was open to other students in the class for critique, which was also graded. This created a vibrant online atmosphere. I was able to retain students' interest, keep them engaged, which is usually difficult to achieve in an online platform. So, so students learned well and enjoyed the rigorous discussion as you know, I could see in the student evaluation of teaching and unique qualitative comments. And the third assessment in groups as well, students were required to produce a video advocacy campaign. Now, two virtual workshops were delivered by Project Liberate, which is a non-governmental organization advocating decent work for women in labor migration under SDG 8. And using the communication for development framework, they educated students on the necessary skills for the mm -hmm. assessment. So to me, an assessment integrating advocacy is impactful, especially where SDGs are concerned. It enables students to think critically about ethical decision making as well as social impacts of um, what they're studying. And it empowers them to lead change and I believe is one of the strongest catalysts for quality education. So this assessment was jointly assessed by Project Liberate and as an icing on the cake, the two best videos will be featured by the NGOs on their website. And lastly, to further enhance the unit and expose students to practical issues and solutions, I created the virtual responsible education series. So overall, nine virtual forums, workshops, and guest lectures were organized in place of traditional lectures, relaying different perspectives to ethics and sustainability in the business environment. So guest speakers included international and local academics, Monash business alumni, entrepreneurs, and global sustainability advocates. Students were really inspired by these workshops, which resulted in internship opportunities. In one case, I was able to mentor a student through her application process and her interviews. She secured an internship in one of the organizations and is currently working on management of SDG scorecard data. So in the student evaluation and teaching units, the overall median score for, this teaching, uh, for teaching of this unit was 4.89 and the unit evaluation was 4.74. So I think the scores, the qualitative comments and student emails, you know, um, uh, were evidence of success and effectiveness of this method. So I do believe that through authentic learning assessments, curriculum and meaningful interaction, 
uh, especially focused on connecting students to real world issues, um, this unit was able to successfully explore ways in a virtual perform, uh, platform to drive education in SDGs. Um, and especially contribute to the mission of the School of Business in Monash University in Malaysia. Yeah. Thanks, Priya. I think um, that your focus there around authentic assessment um, and working with partners, which of course was what Maran was also um, talking about in how important it is in terms of the learning and students' future, employment and opportunities, but also that interaction of that as higher education institutions institutions and educators and researchers that we also have impact upon and um, business industry and other organizations and how that's a two-way thing so it's, a, it's terrific to see that that you've pursued that and of course as you added in the difficult environment we've been in oh so we may come back to that in discussion too i also like that um was my ears pricked up as you were talking about the importance of um advocacy and teaching about advocacy and indeed are in, in the programs that I'm involved in, we're very much being focused too upon looking at advocacy is clearly needs done, but we're also focused on teaching the skills of doing so. So actually looking quite specifically at organising, at campaigning and so on. So um, which has been tremendously exciting as um, students have come up with fabulous things and then they've gone off and pursued them. So yeah. <laughs> put uh, within their workplaces and, and the like. So before we start getting involved in that conversation, and thanks everybody for all the comments coming through on the chat as well. Um, let, let's hear from Giselle, who's gonna, as I said, talk a bit more about some of the general perspective of what the business schools are doing. Welcome back, Giselle. Hi, you get more of me today. <laughs> um, I'd say to me, educating for the SDGs uh, in a business school is primarily how you're preparing your graduates to be able to incorporate the SDGs and the realization of the SDGs into their careers, regardless of what kind of career they choose to have. Uh, this is, it's, it's, it includes understanding their personal role in the SDGs, but to me, it's really about training them to understand the professional role in the SDGs. Uh, in terms of what's happening in business schools, there's a lot of things happening, lots of bits and pieces, not a lot of schools that are taking a very strategic view of this. But we hear the word embedding a lot. I use the word embedding a lot as well. And it's kind of this magic word that nobody really knows exactly what it means and, and, and how to actually do it. But to me, when you're embedding it into a program, you're thinking about all different parts of the program. So the beginning, uh, the initiation, for example, very few schools seem to be including the SDGs in the initiation when their students first come on campus to kind of set the scene of what the SDGs are. Uh, I think if I was Dean of my imaginary fantastic business school, I would have put it in the capstone units. This just seems like an easy place to put it, you know, where everything is coming together. The vast majority of the time, the SDGs are coming up in the sustainability courses and not in the core courses. And I think at the beginning, there might have been some, some you know, valid reasons for that. I know I've heard excuses for the past 10 years from finance faculty about why they're not including sustainability in finance classes, but those excuses aren't so valid anymore because the financial sector, for example, is so advanced when it comes to talking about the SDGs and sustainability that there's so many tools and resources and frameworks that faculty can use within the classroom to embed the SDGs into core courses in different ways. I also don't think that these changes need to be massive there's a lot of small changes you can make in the classroom that can just change the tone of how you're delivering the messages related to your topic. Uh, Federation Business School in their sustainability report, they actually wrote up a really great example of what they did in their marketing class. And they said, without having to make a lot of big changes, they were able to just bring in some different kinds of exercises and different kinds of conversations that allowed them to bring the SDGs into the class as a whole and ensure that all the students in the marketing uh, class got that. So it isn't necessarily about making huge changes or rethinking your whole class. There are lots of little things that you can do as well that can make a big impact. I think one of the big things that I've been pushing is, and I know a lot of Australian and New Zealand schools are doing this already, um, but could tap into more, is having interdisciplinary teams working on projects related to the SDGs in the community. Because these are things that community groups are engaged in every single day without realizing that they're involved in the SDGs. One of the things that I've been doing in my community is identifying uh, projects for students. And I have students from uh, UC, uh, ECU, 
and Murdoch, UWA, and some schools in Canada, Dominican Republic, and Finland at the moment, working on projects, uh, community projects here in Perth, virtually or in person. Uh, across disciplines, they're either individuals working on projects or groups or even whole classrooms working on projects. So there's lots of, and, and I know that this is, it's difficult sometimes to set up these projects, but uh, it's, there are lots of groups in the community that don't understand what the SDGs are, but there are lots of opportunities to help them have that discussion. And for the students, it's fantastic because they get to see how it all comes together. They're not just learning about one particular topic, but they get to put all these challenges together. And um, some of the projects we're doing now, it's interesting because the, the directors of the centers have absolutely no idea what the SDGs are and all of that. So part of their project is even just to help raise this awareness, how to try to convince different people about why the SDGs are important. Uh, and not assume you know, that everybody already knows that. So I think there's lots of different things happening in the community and uh, lots of different ways that we can learn from each other how to bring into the classroom. I think also just the last thing is working across disciplines. And some, a few speakers have said this already. We need to, especially for business schools, business schools like to kind of stay in our little bubble, but we've got all, access to all these other fantastic schools on campus is that, that are also working on SDG related projects. And that's why this call is so great to try to connect some of these different groups and, and not try to do this all alone, to try to, to, to work together on some of these projects. Thanks ever so much, Giselle. And I think um, your final point there about working together and working across the, our universities and indeed further than our own universities. And it's very, really terrific to hear everybody talking about those collaborations across institutions, across countries. So, but why don't I take us back to maybe the question I suspect reading between the lines of some of the chat comments that I think may be worth asking. With, there's a bit, been a bit of talk about how staging and, uh, and getting things, go, um, how to progress things. What I want to start out by asking you is, how did you get started? Where did it come? Where did it start? I and mean, did was it from? I think someone was saying was it a top down thing? Was it a grassroots thing? Did it come from outside? How did you actually get started? Um, Maran, do you want to do you want to respond to that first? Absolutely. I think that's a very good question, and uh, I appreciate all of the feedback so far given by the other panelists because I think that has made it a very uh, enriching conversation. So one thing in particular, I think at ECU School of Business and Law, we've been lucky uh, to observe is that we have had both uh, top-down support from the leadership of the school and the university as a whole, but uh, we also use the bottom-up approach whereby we try to have representations from uh, not only staff from all disciplines and segments of the business school, but also students sitting on the board of the PRME and Sustainability Steering Committee. And uh, recently we have also been trying to reach out to have members from the community also joining the, the group as well. Because personally, I think having this cognitive diversity helps us a lot in um, doing the right thing and being able to make a much more compelling argument in support of all the initiatives that we are trying to propose. The other thing that I would like to quickly address was uh, the important points raised by Giselle around embedding. And one of the exercises that mm -hmm. we have embarked on last year and we are still working on it, uh, which I think has been a really real eye opener for us was trying to map out our courses and programs against SDGs. Um, obviously that was a voluntary initiative, but we have been trying to see where in the program and course we uh, you know, uh, introduce students to the various SDGs. It could be at various levels. It could be uh, a very detailed exercise involving them working on a hands-on project, or it could be simply raising awareness. But by doing this exercise and coming up with these maps for our various programs, we can see what are some of the areas that perhaps we are still missing or there are gaps identified and try to you know, intervene and come up with uh, other things that we could do to make sure that by the end of the program, uh, once the students complete the degree, at least they have been introduced to, they have been working on and uh, learning uh, some hands-on experience in, in terms of interacting with the SDGs. Uh, I think personally, that has been something that uh, has been a good eye opener for us. Uh, in addition to that, I think there are lots of different tools and uh, materials out there available to be utilized. Uh, and many of them are 
available to us free of charge. One uh, in particular that comes to my mind, uh, which students really provided a great feedback about was using these world climate simulation and integrated, in, integrating them in our classes so that uh, you know, they can see uh, hands-on uh, the impact of the decisions that they can make in, in terms of these SDG issues. And lastly, I think to the point of bringing in uh, interdisciplinary colleagues to the discussion, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. And uh, one of the things that the SDG challenge, which I was mentioning, uh, helped our students to have a better understanding of the SDGs was they were mentored by people from diverse backgrounds, some of them coming from School of, School of Arts and Humanities, some coming from School of Science, and that diversity of uh, thoughts and opinion, I think, really helps to better uh, consider the issue from various angles. Thanks. I'll let others jump in who to address that. Where, where, how did you get it started? Giselle? Um, I mean, I can speak more generally with business schools, but I think one of the challenges when it comes to the SDGs and sustainability more broadly is that it's passionate individuals within the schools that usually start pushing this. And even at this stage, it's usually passionate individuals that are focused on this. And as soon as those individuals either leave or burn out or change their focus, then everything kind of falls apart. And you see, it's like this roller, <laughs> I feel like you're all putting me through this roller coaster ride of the school is really advanced and then all of a sudden they disappear and then they're really advanced and they disappear. And that's a challenge that we have moving forward with the SDGs is how do we, how do we embed this into our schools in a way that it will continue regardless of whether we are showing up every single day and pushing these. Because strangely, sustainability seems to be this black or white thing. You're either for it or you're against it. But there's this whole world in the middle. Um, and I think that's one thing that we all need to, uh, to train ourselves better with is how do we sell this to different people in different ways so that we're using their language to sell it to them in a way that we're not even necessarily using the term sustainability or SDG, but just telling them like, this is what is happening in your industry. I had a conversation with my husband last night that he just hired a few MBA students, graduates. And he was really hoping they'd come in and kind of change the feel of the team. And he said, none of them had ever heard of sustainability or the SDGs before. And he got really mad at me, like this was my fault. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, what have you been doing? And he was putting so much, like, so much you know, trust in the fact that this new generation was gonna help, but these were the students that kind of slipped through and they didn't take your ethics class. They didn't mm -hmm. do the community project. So, you know, it's a bit of a tricky situation when, when we're, the champions and we need we need to find a way to get more people in the university involved in different ways indeed and and that does sort of speak to the making those decisions about where to introduce particular units particular ideas in in units in courses and so you don't have that phenomenon that you've just named Giselle as the slipping through not only just do our graduates some of them are slipping through but clearly to be frank, so do some of our colleagues. So, I, and I've been around, as is obvious by looking at me doing this work, Giselle, for a, a very long time. And yes, it does move up and down. And, um, and there, things do come and they do go. The sustainability of educating for sustainability is actually an issue for us. And, it, and there is a matter of grabbing the moment. And that was, uh, and I think Rod was speaking to that before too. And um, when we put on the table, we have a moment and uh, there's something that will give us a chance to grab it. May, may not ride for very long, but you still have to do that because otherwise we go into a lull and it's really hard to get things going. So I think we've got some momentum. Remember all the, how many of us are even listening today, this afternoon, when I'm sure we've all got many, many other pulls on our time. But Priya, do you want to tell us a bit more about how you got started on the course that you're involved in? Well, um, it's exactly what uh, Giselle just mentioned. I'm one of those passionate ones who um, love doing what I do. And, you know, I saw the, the um, importance of SDG in, um, and embedding it into the curriculum um, very, very much uh, uh, in the early stage. But what really gave me the, um, the, the opportunity to drive it seriously was prime because uh, Monash uh, Business School in Malaysia became 
um, advanced signatories in 2017. So that's when, uh, and I became the brand prime ambassador, and that's when I, I was exposed to um, this entire new world where you have research, you have education, you have partnerships, and, and you know, um, focusing and driving SDGs. So I attended conferences and, you know, um, global forums, and I was really quite a, very excited to see um, how uh, the global family was, was doing this in their own school. So when I came back, um, I, uh, you know, and with the full support of the um, head of school who, who um, at, at that time, Professor John Benson, and, you know, he gave me the, the space, he gave me the, uh, the, the opportunity to do whatever I pleased, actually. So, you know, that's when I took the opportunity to create this capstone unit because I found how important it was, like, you know, in a multidisciplinary um, perspective in the School of Business to bring SDGs in. So, uh, like, for my capstone unit, I have students from marketing, from finance, from law, from management. And um, like you said, Giselle, it is, uh, they're hearing about SDGs for the first time and, um, I, and they are more excited about it um, than I am right now. And, you know, through their internships, they are, and, and when they go out now, they are looking for um, NGOs and uh, other organizations and uh, they're asking questions about uh, sustainability and SDGs, which I think is a sign that we have, you know, in a way, um, uh, achieved what, uh, what what I wanted to because I wanted that in, in you know put in put into their uh, psyche and another thing that we have started to do now is um, during orientation week to have Monash responsibility day so I uh, we think that the prime team thinks that you know uh, to get them uh, to introduce this to them in the beginning of um, the entire curriculum in, in, in the business school and to get them then slowly involved in um, uh, the SDGs and the importance of it in their own uh, disciplines. So um, orientation week is a big deal for us. We, we try to do Monash Responsibility Day. Um, we're trying to embed uh, SDGs into our curriculum more and more. And uh, this capstone unit was an example. And I've also um, tried um, doing active learning and industry participation in my corporate governance unit because I'm, I'm, I'm with the Department of Business Law and, and Taxation and, and it was selected as a case reference in the SDSN uh, guide that we have today. So, um, but I do see a challenge because it's not easy to get everybody on board. And that's where um, the problem is like, I, I and a few others, we try to give seminars in, uh, you know, on teaching and learning within the university. We try and um, uh, advertise or, or, you know, put it out there to, to academics, um, uh, you know, uh, teaching. Uh, but there are a few who are interested and, and have grabbed onto it, but um, it's not an easy task. And I would really like to see it at every level. That'd be great in every discipline. <laughs> I think I think we probably share that, and uh, and it is the finding out the what there are various ways that people are going about doing this, and this is probably part of the ongoing conversation that this group here today um, can continue on um, when when good ideas, things that work, things that didn't work, um, and just different tactics for trying to get people involved and get them on site. I was thinking when you were talking, Priya, about the differences between and both um, cohorts of my colleagues and students and, um, and, and how things are easier in one area and than in another. One of the areas that I'm involved in is teaching criminal justice. And the students in that area are of course very much motivated, well I shouldn't say of course, but our students are very much motivated by concern about the lack of justice, about the lack of equality, um, about diversity and inclusion and fairness. They're very much uh, focused around the uh, big issues um, and big issues of course uh, of incarceration of First Nations people in a Australia, their terrible history there, why it hasn't changed. So they, they're thinking they're thinking about these sorts of things. When I I say, okay, and I said we we were talking about in terms of planetary health at Victoria University, and I start talking about some mahos about um 
uh, biodiversity, for example, they're like, hey, where does that fit in our story? And then, of course, you'll have another group of students who'll be big on that. But why, does, why is deaths in custody an issue here too? So I find all those things very um, exciting, challenging, but at times worrying about how how get people to get that sort of thinking across and beyond. And I think that point that I think um, Rod might have made earlier about that getting people who aren't already talking, aren't already part of it, part of this, this conversation. Some of those students- but, but I have to, I have to say, that, I mean, there are incredible people in all the disciplines like managing there marketing. Are. You know, they're doing great work, uh, you know. Um, I mean, I, I'm not the only one, but uh, to get like the entire uh, business school and like Giselle just said, you know, working with other schools in the university and a broader agenda, there's a lot to be done. But I think uh, we have, we have come quite far as a school, as a school of business. Um, but obviously, there's more to be done. <laughs> These oh. are just my examples. <laughs> No, I, and your examples are inspirational. So that's and so that sharing it, which is what everybody's doing here, is so critical. Sam, what's it like in New Zealand? I hope is, is there is this where we've got a lot of Australian conversation, Australian institutions, Priya being attached to Monash too. Um, yeah, ha, where are things at in New Zealand in doing? Uh, this? So I mean, I I can only really talk for Massey because I I only came to New Zealand about a year and a half ago, but. Um, in terms of what they did here, and this is also not a course specific, this is more of a program um, yeah. where, but in terms of how did we get it started and what really worked? Well, I think the people before me, um, what happened was there was a call, there was a call within the college for a new degree that was going to be unique and relevant to the current times. And this is the degree that that they chose to go with. And I think what worked really well is that the people who put it together and then you know put forward their idea. They, they, they thought they were very strategic in terms of how they promoted the benefits to the college and the university as a whole. So for example, there's only one other masters of the SDGs in the world and that is at a university in Italy. So it's the only one in the Southern hemisphere. So once so straight away, people who are in the position to make decisions are listening because now you've thrown out something that's unique. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, I've been trying to think about how I could link it in with what the other speakers have been saying, you know, so, you know, if you want to say, you know, well, listen, what? let's make our business school unique in terms of saying, well, listen, we're a business school who's got the SDGs at the forefront. This is relevant. Nobody else is doing it. Um, it helps to get that support from above if you speak their language. That's, that's something that I've witnessed here. Sustainability here in New Zealand seems to be a very, very popular topic, though. So, I mean, for me, from what I've seen, it, I feel as though it's something everyone is trying to do. Um, Definitely across the university. I mean, SDGs pop up all over the place. We've got a, you know, um, we've got a unit for sustainability for the university that is very loud and vocal. Um, even from the government, though, you know, the, the talk of sustainability comes down all the time. Um, I have no idea what the what the what the situation in Australia is like, but I feel as though it's a very hot topic in New Zealand, and so the opportunities are are there for people to take. The most of it and then linking to what Giselle said um, it's about finding um, and you as well Priya it's about finding the right people you know so which has a which has a potential downfall because if you then lose those people you lose the momentum but for example with our situation with my situation where every year we're trying to bring on new specializations um, to grow the different options the key is that is whenever um, we look at which you know if anything that determines which departments we approach to say, hey, do you want to be part of this interdisciplinary cross-disciplinary program? The first thing we, we ask ourselves is, is there a leader, there? is there a champion for this program there? And we, like, like you were saying, Priya, there are actually people everywhere. So where we see people who are like-minded, we just get on board with them and we sit down and we have the conversations and we try and get them excited. And I think what's, um, it's, yeah, it feels as though, as though things might be a little bit difference in New Zealand is I don't know if the challenge is as difficult because it seems as though it's something people are very keen to be part of um, I mean most of the time when we say to the departments and also you know in universities people are worried about another thing that's interesting that we do sorry sometimes I have like 15 ideas that are all at the same time but another thing that's worked really well in what we're doing is that all of our specializations none of them require new courses 
So what happens is that our students join other people's courses that already exist. So same thing, we are, we're speaking the language that the decision makers want to hear, where we go and we say, listen, we're gonna get you 10 new students, but you don't have to actually develop a new course. You just have to bring 10 new in, you know, into, your, into the course that you're already teaching. And so that like, you know, learning to speak the language of those, you know, of those who make the decisions is definitely something that I've witnessed working here. Um, but people are very open to that here. I mean, people, the SDGs are big. Um, everywhere I've been, it's been something that uh, people talk about a lot. Um, most people are aware of them. It, but like, but in that case, I mean, it comes down. It's spoken about on the radio. I see it. I see it in government documents. Uh, so it might be a little bit different there. I don't know if I'm just rambling on now. Um, I suppose the two main contributions that I think I would be able to add to this in terms of how did we start and how did we get there? Well. We, the people, not me, because I wasn't, I didn't do it so much, but um, the people who did it spoke the language of those who made the decisions, which really got the ball rolling. That really helped us to get it started. And then the second thing that's really helped is bringing, finding those passionate people, finding the people who, so for us, it was finding the guy in economics who really felt strong about this. And he's one of the, he's the only guy in the economics department who actually, you know, really feel strongly about the SDGs, but we've got him on board. And now the whole economics department is, is like, you know, well, what's, what's this SDGs? Hey, we're getting all these new students. This is fantastic. Where does this come from? So just slowly bringing those people together and then just doing it, like just take the leap, go with it. Um, and then I suppose the, the last thing I'd say is, and this is something that, that I have um, really, um, you know, tried hard to is I unashamedly, um, promote what we're doing like unashamedly I'm everywhere I've got my banner everywhere we go oh that's just to actually block the sunlight but everywhere I go at Massey everywhere I go I unashamedly tell people what we're doing and how it's working and it's starting to filter I don't know if that helps oh I think um I think as well as the people on the screen nodding wildly at the <laughs> very um <laughs> all they're saying they're stop constant, talking. constantly promoting what we're doing I suspect everybody if I we put everybody who's listening on the screen at the moment that'll be going yes you've got it you've got to talk about it all the time but we want to anyway so, <laughs> so I think that's a really important thing just, to add, to, the, just to, to add to that something about the SDGs that is so helpful is the SDGs are so easy to market because they're bright and they're colorful and I know it's a simple little thing but actually you can bring them in all over the place and I mean for me the challenge is to find somewhere that I can't link the SDGs I mean if that's for me a greater challenge than can I link it it's like I can't I mean maybe like Greek classical literature I might struggle but you know everywhere you can link the SDGs uh, well I think one of the approaches and a number of you have spoken to this too is there's there's both the work of coming up with um, courses, units, capstone units, starting in first year and issues. So a lot of um, variety in these, but and a bit of let's try and see what um help what works. But then also a number of you also mentioned the any unit that doesn't look like it lends itself to taking such approaches. Creating that environment where students may choose to do a topic that picks up an SGG theme and, and is able to articulate and name it as such. I, I think that's one of the techniques to, for students to learn, as well as for us as um, educators too, about how this does um, come, come in across. We're going to run out of time soon, but I actually want to ask um, uh, question which um, is something I'm intrigued about before I go on with a final question of a final word of advice or thought final thought for you so we'll go around and do that at the end but first of all I wanted to ask you what SDGs do you find people are taking up that people talk about more Priya so uh, thinking that your feels in the business schools so I'm now just looking at my colourful pictures on the wall. Um, are people talking about um, water? Are they talking about poverty? Are they talking about peace and security, about partnerships? Which are the SDGs that come to the fore? Which are the, I suppose, my underlying question is, which are the easy and which are the hard ones? To bring? <laughs> You've got your on mute at the moment. <laughs> 
So um, from from my experience, mm. um, the SDGs that have uh, you know um, been been a very easy or around the school of business has been decent work um, yeah. because a lot a lot of a lot of areas come under the decent work: women in labor migration, um, you know, uh, um, even forced labor trafficking, all those sorts of things. A lot of things coming in there, and then uh, partnerships. Um, responsible consumption, cutting across uh, the different disciplines like uh, marketing, management, and um, yeah, um, environmental sustainability, and how uh, businesses are, are responsible in in many ways. Uh, you know, to, uh, when we look at environmental sustainability, and yeah, these are the few that I can uh, just speak up. I'll, I'll leave to the rest to. Thanks. Uh, Marin, what, what do you think about this? Sure, I think uh, looking at our experience, one of the things that we did in our business school, obviously we were aware that it's very difficult to concentrate, concentrate on all of the SDGs. So we had mm. to, as our focus area, narrow down, on, narrow down on a couple of those SDGs for the committee. We chose, based on the relevance of the business school and the research that was done in our school, uh, SDG 8, 10, 12, and 13, with the addition of obviously quality education. But then if I were to you know, share with you some of the evidence that we saw in that SDG challenge that we conducted throughout WA, one particular thing that we noticed, uh, while we gave students four SDGs to choose from, again, SDGs eight, 10, 12, and 13, because that was collectively what the business schools in WA thought could be our priority areas. We noticed that majority of the teams, in fact, um, uh, five teams chose to work on SDG 8, which goes similar to what Priya was saying earlier on. Then SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, as well as climate action, were the uh, other two popular SDGs. And lastly, the SDG, which to me surprisingly got the least interest was SDG 10, which was reduce inequalities. On the flip side though, ironically, the team working on SDG 10 ended up winning the competition, which was interesting. But uh, that was the least popular SDGs among the four, which I mentioned. That's so interesting. We could have a now long discussion further about this, but I'd better give Giselle and Sam a chance to answer. Giselle? Uh, I think SDG 12 is the one that I have the most interesting conversations about because sustainable production consumption, that's something that doesn't necessarily scream sustainability. It just, it, it's mm. been, you see this every day, you can have discussions, there's lots of interesting, innovative technologies coming out and approaches, it's, people are talking about it. Um, I agree with what's been said about the ones that aren't talked about as much. I think SDG four, maybe I sh that's a controversial one to bring up in this group, but I think we all assume that we're involved in SDG four, but we're not necessarily, just because we're in education, there is still that kind of quality word in there. I don't think we have enough conversations about, you know, obviously we, everybody has very high quality programs, but is it high quality in terms of the SDGs? So I think I'd like to see more conversations in terms of that. I think that's a really interesting point, Giselle. And I'm also noticing on the chat, I've, I've said, but don't forget the SDGs are all interrelated and one needs to approach it in that way. I totally, I totally agree with that, but but that, which is why I'm actually so interested in the ways that people tease out and focus on particular areas and where they do and don't put things together in them. And indeed the SDG targets in themselves speak to making these connections or don't sufficiently do so. And that in, as well is controversial in itself. So um, I don't have... We are about, I'm about to be told we're about, we're about to run out of time. So I'll leave that as a conversation, hopefully to continue. Um, and I agree that quality education does not seem to be as much part of our conversations, except for those in education schools. I, I'm not, but I'd also, I'm also quite um, interested in how decent work is approached. And it may actually be, I think looking at the goals of interest of uh, the goal of, of decent work, the targets for decent work, and indeed the conditions within which our universities are run and the way work is run in our universities, it's very much an issue for us in and beyond our actual classrooms. I'm just putting on my trade union hat there. Some of you will recognize me as I did used to be national president of our union in Australia. But um, I keep thinking there's all these great, great things going on and yet, how are people being employed to work in them? And 
decent work is not what in Australia the majority of educators in higher ed have. Um, so my last thing to close us up and move on, just a one sentence. If you someone came and said, I'm about to want to get something started at my university, my program, my course, what's something you'd ask it, you'd say to them to help them along, Priya? Are you still are you on mute? Sorry. I would I would say if you're designing a, 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 a you know an assessment or a, a something along those lines I would uh, say think it through think it through think the design through um, um, and I would say uh, try to think of the I mean the fact that we are online try to think of the, the technical difficulties that may come about the issue of you know isolation and um, how do we get around it because um, student learning in an online platform is there are challenges and um, I would also uh, uh, this is something personal I, I think it's important to bridge bridge the gap between higher education and the, the industry and the business sector so um, and, and I think SDGs are now at, at, at a national scale and it's very important to businesses as well so like, like in Malaysia, businesses are eager to work with the university um, in terms of the assessments, in terms of modules, they, they are open to it and they are keen on it. So I think we, sh we should take advantage of that and um, see what best partnerships and collaborations can arise from um, stakeholders, civil society, NGOs um, and business um, entities. Indeed, and I think um, it was Kath that commented in the chat earlier on that um, no need to worry, um, businesses are pivoting very quickly anyway, as other things I, does actually make the point of don't we have a responsibility to be on the front foot on this in our universities. I'm literally, run, I have actually run out of time, but let's give everyone another sentence. Sam? I would say two things. I would say just do it. If you have an idea, just do it and go with it. And if it doesn't work, try something new the next time. Don't be afraid to think out of the box and be creative. And link to that, I would say, don't ask for permission. Rather, apologize afterwards if you get into trouble. So, you know, I think it's, we don't need to be, we don't need to be shy. We need to be bold and we need to, if you have a good idea, give it a try. Worst thing, worst case scenario, you have to say, sorry, it didn't work. But just go, don't wait. <laughs> Because I, I do that. I try something and then apologize later. I never asked for permission. So but yeah, I see. I mean, I come, so I come okay. from Africa, so I always have that fallback. Like, oh, sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> Giselle. <laughs> I totally agree with Sam there. Um, I'd also say that, you know, you don't have to do it by yourself. Ask around. You'd be surprised at how many other people, even, even faculty that don't seem like they're interested, um, they might have a PhD specializing in sustainability. Like you, and this has happened, you know, just ask around, ask in the community, ask your business partners, ask your other faculty. You don't have to do it by yourself and, and just go for it, yeah. Fabulous, Maran? Uh, adding to the points said by others, I would say be mindful of Hello? I think we're all good, Jenny, if you wanna keep going. Oh, good. Um, I wasn't sure that it was me or someone else that had gone a bit unstable. <laughs> uh, look, I think we'd better finish up and move on. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, all of you, for your contributions here and for all the marvellous conversation going on in the chat. Tal started us out with that we are um, also that we are taking ourselves towards tomorrow too in looking at barriers and obstacles. But I think this session's just showed that there might be some barriers and obstacles, but um, that's not gonna stop us. So I'll now ha hand back to you, Belinda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenny, and a very big thank you to, to our panelists. Um, I hope you all feel really inspired um, and, uh, and inspired yeah, to make change and to think a little bit differently. And I know I am looking forward to listening to the recording because I could not write down all your ideas fast enough. Um, so promise that the recording will come out so we can um, sit back again over a nice cup of tea and listen to some of these brilliant words and ideas and also um, go, go, go through the chat with all the links there. So thank you everyone for sharing that. 
Hi everyone and good afternoon, uh, evening or morning. Uh, thank you for joining us from all over the globe. Um, and a very special thank you to those who are joining us for a second day. Um, thanks for, for, for returning back. Would like to acknowledge that the beautiful lands from which um, I am presenting on are Aboriginal lands. And as we gather to share stories and ways of knowing, may we always remember the knowledge is held forever within the traditional custodianship of country. Uh, may we each just take a few seconds um, to look out our window and be grateful for our beautiful lands, our water and our sun. Uh, I pay respect uh, to our elders past and to all Aboriginal colleagues who may be uh, listening today or listening on the recording in the future. For those um, who weren't on the call yesterday, uh, I am Dr Belinda Gibbons, um, the Prime Australia and New Zealand Chapter Chair and I'm delighted to be joined here and partnering with Tal Kirsten from um, the SDSN network and also with Rhiannon Boyd from um, AXE um, uh, for day two of accelerating education for the sustainable development goals for higher education institutions in our region. Just a quick recap of, of day one. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the movie Fast and Furious, um, but I use that analogy because in such a short amount of time we were presented yesterday with so many insightful experiences, examples and opinions from well over 90 participants of what's happening in our classrooms. And yesterday was a real focus on why now is the right time to ramp up education for the sustainable development goals in higher education institutions in our region. And we heard from Giselle Waybright and Professor Rod Glover who provided a faculty and a policy perspective on the need for future generations to speak and understand the holistic nature of our world's greatest challenges and the prime role that higher education institutions have to play in that, in that ambition. We heard from an inspiring panel who presented interdisciplinary projects and we finished day one with an activity which gave us time to work on um, what a learning outcome may look like that includes sustainable development. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, I can't wait to get the recording from that session so I can sit back and listen again to all the wonderful examples presented um, and not only from our panelists and speakers, but also that was presented in the chat. So please um, keep sharing those examples today so that we can note all that down and, and, and forward that to you in, in due course uh, when Tal gets all that together. I see her smiling. Um, and I have no doubt that today will be just as exciting. And today we will hear from more wonderful speakers with an institutional focus. And we'll finish with an activity to hear your ideas for action moving forward. And so we hope everyone stays and everyone can share. Um, yesterday, no, we noticed there were a couple of comments around, I'm not a, a teacher, so therefore, um, uh, can't necessarily input into, into this activity, but um, our professional staff and those not in necessarily in a face-to-face -face or online teaching role, are, are opinions are just as equally as important if we're going to tackle um, education for the sustainable development goals in our, in our institutions. So please stick with us. Um, I'm really excited to hand over our first session today to Associate Professor Annette Boss. Annette is the Deputy Director for Education at Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Um, and the floor is all yours, Annette. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Belinda. And um, welcome, uh, everyone. Um, I also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the different lands we're all joining from and uh, pay my respect to elders past, present and, uh, and emerging. And like many others, I'm also um, joining uh, from Wurundjeri land. As Melinda just introduced me, I'm actually leading the education program at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And I'm not sure if you're familiar um, with what we do, but we've got a thriving and very varied education program. Uh, we are active in the co-curricular as well as in the curricular space. Uh, both on undergraduate and postgraduate uh, levels. Um, we also do uh, executive open and tailored uh, education. 
and more and more we're becoming involved in uh, not only educational research but also uh, uh, research around workforce skills gaps uh, in sustainability fields etc for example to uh, support transitions um, within various sectors such as energy uh, a lot is happening at Monash uh, Broad around education for uh, the SDGs. And one of our flagships is uh, the Masters of Environment and Sustainability. And yesterday there was quite a lot that came up about uh, cross, uh, cross disciplinary, cross faculty collaboration. And this was actually the first collaboration, uh, cross masters collaboration at Monash between uh, the Faculty of Science, Arts, Bezeco and uh, MSDI and, uh, and we, are, um, um, we are sitting in the office of the provost and working uh, across a lot of faculties. As became clear from the conversation yesterday, um, we need integration for the SDGs uh, for our and to drive our education, but also within the wider universities to drive this agenda. And of course, of course in support of the education, um, a big topic that derived from yesterday and also from the information you provided when you signed up for this was around how to get buy-in at all levels. How do we get institutional buy-in? How do we get colleagues and leadership on board? How can we make institutional changes, et cetera? And, and that is what we'll be focusing on today. Uh, at Monash, over the past years, we have uh, been involved in numerous ways uh, of making this happen. Uh, for example, our colleague uh, Tal Kesten, uh, who co-organized this, has been instrumental in developing a guide that aims to help uh, universities, uh, colleges, um, higher education institutions to implement and mainstream and accelerate education for the SDGs. And if you don't know this document, the guide pr really presents uh, lots of cases and numerous practical tips of how you may go about it. We also have increasingly graduate research um, happening in this space. You know, um, how do we mainstream SDGs across univer the university? One. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Guitar Angeli Badi, has been working on a project aimed uh, at integrating uh, interdisciplinary sustainable, uh, sustainable healthcare education framework across 13 health professional courses in the Faculty of Medicine. And when we talk about really institutioning embedding, embedding um, this research team, this project team has um, adopted a mixed method uh, approach to understand uh, not only uh, new solutions for how doing so, but also uh, current practice and how, um, um, how staff feels towards this. And um, this has led to a publication where all recommendations are now being adopted by the leadership of, of this big faculty. Um, yeah, truly quite an achievement. Um, we have the School of Business, who has been very active uh, around the Prime Hub. We have got the Science Faculty, who has a whole plan around green and sustainable um, green chemistry education, etc. But today we're not here to hear in depth about uh, Monash. Uh, today, um, uh, really want to acknowledge that interesting work is done. Uh, across um, uh, Australia and well beyond. And um, I, of course, am very happy to, uh, to hear from the speakers when I looked up all the activities. I'm very excited by, uh, by what is to come. But I also would like to encourage everyone to share um, what you are doing, you know, and maybe some links. Everything will be collated and, uh, and shared uh, at the end of or after this. Uh, this um, two days. So without further ado, let us get uh, into this session. Uh, the purpose of the panel today is uh, to explore uh, institutional approaches from our region to integrating education for the SDGs across a faculty or an institution and learn from the different experiences 
uh, research process. And I'm really uh, excited to uh, invite the first uh, speaker. Um, we will have one uh, keynote speaker followed by um, brief remarks from three, uh, three panel members. Um, the keynote speaker today is uh, Professor Simon Berry, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Vice President uh, from Western Sydney University. And he will be talking about Western Sydney Un uh, University's 21st century project. And uh, Simon, uh, very welcome. Um, great uh, that you're here today. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Bujari Gambara, uh, which is g'day in the local language of the Darak. Um, let me also acknowledge that I am joining you from the lands of the Baramadigal clan um, of the Darak nation. Baramadigal is, is, is the name of the local clan that was adopted and translated to become Parramatta, the place where this university is based. Um, it is the place where the eels come down to sleep, to lie. Uh, which is a lovely, a lovely piece of language. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I, I am very grateful for that chance to share some of our work, but I, I'm desperately keen to hear some of the fantastic things that are going on around this network of people. Um, one of the things about sustainability is that you only ever make an impact if you do it in collaboration with a lot of people. It is not something that any one institution is going to make a dent on. Um, can you just go to the first slide, please, Bill? Um, just before I start to talk a bit about our institutional strategy, I, I need to tell you a little bit about our institution, um, because I think you can only understand it if you understand the region and you understand who we are. So Western Sydney University um, is a brash upstart. We're less than 30 years old. And a bit like some 30 year olds, we have a changing sense of our own identity. Um, but Western Sydney is, is one of the fastest growing economic regions in the country. It is home to some of the most amazing economic opportunities. It is home to over 170 different nationalities within a stone's throw of my office, and they are represented in our university community. It's also home to one of the largest concentrations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and Pacific Islander peoples um, in Australia. It is the migration hub, I suppose, of the country. As along with all of that incredible opportunity, it is also home to some of the most deeply entrenched disadvantage, particularly educational disadvantage, that Australia likes to ignore. Um, so it, it is a region with huge promise, but with huge problems. Um, the graphic that's on the screen in front of you is, is a graphic from our, our new strategic plan. Um, and it's, it's one that is only just still at the printers, actually, it hasn't even come back from the printers. Um, but that is a, a plan that talks about, is called sustaining success. Um, it is a plan that is unashamedly values driven, those values of boldness, fairness, integrity and excellence. But it is a plan that is premised on some key principles and those principles drive everything we do. And you will see that the first principle there is sustainability. That is about our commitment as a university to work to ensure a better quality of life for all, for now and in the future, in a just and equitable manner, while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. That's how this university starts to talk about itself. Underneath that, there are, there are four key priorities that, that are probably worth just flagging for people. Number one is to prioritise learning and research that promotes the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the sustainability of the environment. Principle 1.1, first on the list, top of the list. Number two is encourage global engagement that links approaches to sustainability. Number three is about designing our campuses, facilities, policies, every aspect of what we do as an organisation in ways that are committed to addressing environmental concerns. And number four is ensuring that our graduates are highly employable because of their awareness and commitment to sustainability. The reason I highlight that is that that is not what our last strategic plan, which is only five years old, said. Our last strategic plan did not talk about sustainability in that way. It was there and it was infused, but it was not explicit. It's now explicit. We just go to the next slide. Um, 
one of the ways that I that we want to talk about that is is about how we work as a university across, I suppose, the core framework, the notion of our curriculums, our operation, our research and our engagement. And I want to talk to you about curriculum and just a particular slice of that curriculum. Um, and I want to talk to you about the strategic initiative that we have around innovation and transformation of our curriculum. And we called that 21C. It started in 2018. Um, and it has just had a, another lease of life for the next three years with a significant investment from our, our board of trustees. Um, it has three frames to it, the notion of transforming curriculum, which is very much around how we future-proof our existing curriculum um, for the disrupted world of society and work. Second piece is around transforming teaching, how you have a, a teaching pedagogy and a teaching workforce that is fit for purpose and contemporary. And the third piece is around how you think about innovating in the alternative credential space. So you provide opportunities and pathways for education, to education for those who don't want a full degree. Next slide. Um, I want to really just focus on the very first one and I'm only going to focus on a slice of it. So there is plenty more to read. Please do come back and read the website. Um, the curriculum challenges, as we call them, is an opportunity for us to think about how we did a few things. First of all, how we simplified the degree structure across the university so that I could build snazzy new things and insert them into the degrees, no matter what the degree was. Um, one of the things around, and to bring that back to sustainability, one of the things around sustainability is there's often lots of little pieces of sustainability, or as we've heard, there's whole degrees about sustainability but we have 50,000 students at Western Sydney. I wanna make sure that nearly all of them have some exposure to sustainability. How am I gonna do that? I needed to think about a way of inserting things into degrees that was quite different. So we took a strategic approach, redesigned our degree architecture so that we could create elements that would plug in. And the key plugins that we started to think about were a notion of what we call um, sub-majors or minors within a degree and something that we call curiosity pods, which are smaller elements of a, than a unit of study. So they are very small elements. We designed the architecture, we built the prototypes for those things. And what we are now starting to do is build those curriculum elements at scale across the institution. So we will have 10 new sub-majors by the end of this year. We will probably have about 25 new curiosity pods. Um, the way we have organised that work is around the challenge of developing graduates who are future thinkers, global citizens, innovative entrepreneurs, sustainability advocates, ding ding, and STEM practitioners, because that notion of STEM is so important. Um, if we can go to the next slide, what I want to do is just talk to you a little bit about a couple of those curriculum elements in the SDG space. Um, and that should give you a bit of a flavour to ask some questions, I hope. Um, one of the first curiosity pods that we developed, and my colleague Jen Dolan, who I see on the, in the audience was integral to this, was a curiosity pod about um, an introduction to the concept of sustainability through the SDGs. Um, it, is, it was designed very much as something that would be accessible to lots and lots of students. It was something that could be offered to students as a co-curriculum element. It could be embedded within subjects by academics as a teaching and learning activity, with or without assessment. It could be something that formed an integral component of a different qualification, it could stack up as an alternative credential and something else. Um, when we developed this, we thought we wanted to see if it would work at scale, and it did. We had over 900 students in 2019 participate in this as an embedded uh, curriculum element in a couple of programs in business, health, industrial design, architecture, nursing and education. Um, in a couple of places, we've embedded it within core undergraduate and postgraduate units and nuanced it to the different levels with different types of assessment. We also ran an extracurricular version, which is something students do just for the sheer love of it, not for any offer of credit. And we had students who put their hand up and did that, um, students with spare time at university to do things. What also we did last year was we started to think about how we engage staff and we had 100 staff mixture of professionals and academics from my division, engaged with the pod to think about how staff could develop sustainability literacy. And we even had 35 staff graduate with their digital badge in from the sustainability bootcamp. It gives you a bit of an idea about that. If you want to know some more details about that, person to get in touch with is Jen Dolan. Um, move on to the next slide, please. Um, 
the people who are leading the work around the development of these um, new curriculum elements are not people like me. They're not people um, in my team or division like Jen. They are academics that we have um, brought together from across the schools of the university. So we are letting this be led by the academics, but they are not building it alone. They're building it on a notion that we call partnership pedagogy, which is a way of thinking about approaching, um, it's all right, Jen, you're welcome. Um, a way of thinking about approaching the building of curriculum as a genuinely collaborative undertaking. And that's collaborative both with our students, with external partners, with a range of things and a range of people that we think are influential and have a stake in students learning about whatever it is they're learning about. Um, the partners that we started to work about uh, with on our sustainability area were obviously groups like the um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. They were our connections through the RCE, our connections into the UN. Um, those are groups that have been actively engaged in building this, which is great. Um, the new group of people that are working on this are starting to think about building new curiosity pods and they built a really interesting one last year which was called unpacking COVID from cuisine to quarantine um, which was a way to start to think about the impacts of COVID and particularly some of the ways that would play out across SDGs. Um, we started to embed the major, sub major or minor as it will be called in the future on global sustainability into more degrees. So it suddenly became of interest to the data science degrees and for health science students as well. Our champions are now starting to think about what they build next. And the list that I saw only last week, the initial sketches of the handbook entries for the next two sub majors, one is around biodiversity for life and one is around water futures. Um, if we just move on to the next one, um, what I want to do is just leave you with a couple of key points. The where next. Um, the next thing we are moving on to is a decadal strategy, which is a 10-year strategy looking at where this institution goes in its commitment to sustainability. I'll let you just read through that list of priority statements. They give you a sense of how we see sustainability as a very broad thing. The last slide I'm going to leave you with is not one I'm going to play the video of, but it's a bit of a teaser. Um, if you log on to our website and have a look for this slide, you'll find it. Um, it is around, it's a video that our students made about the benefits of co-creating change with students. It makes a huge difference to how you go about building institutional engagement if your students are engaged. Thank you very much. I've probably gone over my 10. I will stop there. very much Simon and uh, no you didn't go too much over thank you for answering the questions that I see coming up uh, yeah. um, it's really exciting uh, Simon to see this um, all of university approach and especially the strategy and of course for me it raises questions that I hope to go into a bit later maybe like what were your barriers and how did you overcome them because you know it's a big difference in strategic direction so uh, thank you for that. Um, I would like to uh, move on uh, to, the, to the panel. Um, we've got three uh, panel members uh, who've been each asked to uh, give an, um, five minutes uh, remarks on some of their own uh, practice. And I just would like to uh, um, introduce them all uh, to you. Uh, the first one is Dr. Kristen mckenzie Shoulders from uh, Bond University. And she is uh, the food service domain lead in the Masters of Nutrition and Diet Dietetics. And she will be talking about the process of curriculum redesign and provide us with a case study. After that, uh, uh, Jonathan Howard from uh, Charles Stur uh, Sturt University will be talking about mainstreaming competences in sustainability across all different uh, graduates. Uh, and last one, uh, and but not least, we will hear from uh, Harsh Suri from uh, Deakin University. Uh, she will be talking about a programmatic uh, approach to integrating uh, the SDGs in uh, Deakin's business school. So welcome. I'm very glad that you're all here. And uh, Kristen, it's over to you. Thank you so much for having me. And my name is Kristen mckenzie Shalders, and I want to acknowledge the Kumberi people of the Yukumba language on whose lands Bond University now stands and pay respect to uh, their elders past, present and emerging. 
Um, these types of initiatives are always has been, has been said by Simon and others, um, the result of many people. And I guess I, my role in this is interesting as someone that's not very senior in an organisation and, you know, my role in collaborating and working with others to aim to facilitate change here at Bond University. So I'm the food service domain lead of the Master of Nutrition and Dietetic Practice program. And food service by nature of, of the area is around the business and scalability of food. So I work and teach in spaces like um, change management for menus or um, you know, ordering systems and so on. And a lot of those skills are really transferable when you start talking about you know, implementing sustainability into curriculum and organisations. And this is an area I'm really, very personally and professionally invested in. So I see the integration of the SDGs as a process. Um, there's not one endpoint or there's no prescription and there's many different ways that you can do this. And as you're aware, there's education, embedding frameworks, um, change management strategies, and different ways we can guide change. And I guess I encourage people to put in the chat, you know, tools you've used or frameworks you've used or strategies that you've found successful for facilitating curriculum redesign or, you know, organisational change. So I just wanted to briefly highlight our process here, and we're quite early in the process. Um, and I no doubt our experience will be different to others. So in 2019, Bond University became signatory to the SDGs and we did some mapping, which is standard of curriculum and so on. And we did find some gaps in there that we did know that we're teaching some curriculum and you know, it wasn't getting picked up. So it wasn't necessarily reflected in the learning outcomes or synopses and so on. Um, at around the same time, some peers and a shout out to them, um, Professor Michelle McLean from medicine and Joe Bishop um, Associate Professor Joe Bishop from Medicine and myself put forward a recommendation to our faculty executive for a sustainability um, advisory committee that was supported. In 2020, I became the chair of that committee. And we've talked a lot about communication and the importance of breaking down silos. So a key strategy I had in taking on chairing that committee was inviting the director of planning for the university who's also responsible for the implementation of the SDGs for, to the university onto that committee. But also I sit now on a lot of faculty committees, learning and teaching, student staff liaison, interprofessional education with that lens and hat for sustainable development. Um, in 2020, we also championed with our Dean of our faculty and with our faculty business manager, um, integration of SDGs into the uh, faculty strategic plan, um, particularly related to um, uh, curriculum. And this has really helped us leverage change. And so since 2020, we've identified, similar to what Simon was talking about, across all of our programs, change champions or emerging leaders, so basically advocates within each of our programs that are responsible or have taken leadership in looking at curriculum, mapping the SDGs um, and informing curriculum redesign and assessment updates. And we're in the process of that, you know, transferring to learning outcomes and program outcomes and so on. As well as this, we have core programs at Bond. So similar to others where all undergraduate students do those programs, we're doing similar things and incorporate, it's an it's a obvious place to explicitly talk about the SDGs. And we have found one gap is we may teach them the content but it's that continual linkage back to the useful framework that is the SDGs. Um, I don't have the time to discuss all the types of curriculum innovations we've done, um, and that's not the role of this session, but Michelle McLean might put some of the things that we've done into the chat. Um, for example, green points for sustainable development goal related activities and um, planetary health assignments. And we found it's a really good opportunity for you know, collaboration between programs. So for example, I put together a training module um, on the SDGs for our placements, both student and supervisor training that is now, um, which talks about our commitment to the SDGs, but also how they can be implemented on placements, which is now being, you know, rolled out across other programs like physio and OT. I should recognise that there's a lot of work happening across the university. So, you know, We've got climate change law degree, transformation co-lab degrees focusing on the SDGs, Faculty Society of Design for a long time has a um, degree in sustainable development, but we're aiming to break down those silos and have an all institutional approach. That's me.
for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kristen. Uh, you planned it very well. And, uh, and thank you for highlighting uh, the importance of, uh, of processes. And what I heard earlier, the, the, the change champions. And uh, it would be very interesting to hear more about how they are uh, instituted and um, yeah, the incentives around it. So thank you very much. And from here, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, Jonathan to speak. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks for taking time to listen to me. My name is Jonathan Howard, and I've been asked to talk about what I've done to support the uptake of SDGs in higher education at my university. I work at Charles Sturt University, which is Wiradjuri country. And those who don't know where Charles Sturt University is, it's basically situated in several campuses across regional New South Wales in Australia. Now, I've only got five minutes to talk, so um, I'm going to cut my message down to four key takeaway messages uh, that hopefully you'll remember. Uh, the first mes key message I have is our approach started by making sustainability a graduate learning outcome and then setting an explicit way about how we might go about measuring it. So CSU created a, a set of graduate learning outcomes. I mean, Simon Barry should be aware of this. We've drawn on his literature um, in some respects. These are properties that all university graduates should have. So CSU um, set a set of nine of them. And just to get you familiar with them, they're things like ethics, lifelong learning, digital literacy. One of, outcome, one of our outcomes is sustainable practices. So that's something that every graduate has to have. Now that we've set these sort of common outcomes, we then had to work out a way of measuring it. And if you look at the literature and the practice and all that sort of stuff, how do we know whether a graduate has an outcome? A key way is an evidence-based approach, which says that somewhere in the degree, an assessment has to get students to apply sustainable practices. So just the key message there is that CSU is committed to ensuring that nearly all of its 10,000 graduates, which finish each year, have demonstrated some form of sustainable practices, whether they be dentists, doctors, managers, or IT specialists. So that's sort of the change that we had in front, in front of us, a, a major curriculum transformation. So the key message now, the next key message is we started it by um, creating a key online resource, which is really to assist people doing that change. And it, so we developed a one-stop shop, a resource hub, and it was for subject conveners, course designers and faculty boards so that we could they could learn about subject level resources, course level resources, workplace learning. Now that's important to us as a university because we're a university of the profession. So we teach a lot of people with professional outcomes and also those involved in quality assurance. Uh, some of those resources are about how the SDGs can contextualize the basic principles of sustainability. Um, an A to Z, which I've got here um, online on how to implement sustainability on all our courses. So in, for business management, for example, those people who are in prime, it talks about the rationale. It talks about examples from the UK uh, of subjects that do that sort of stuff. It talks about resources you can pull down. Uh, the same thing online for workplace learning about professional associations um, that have that, such as nursing or dentistry about applying sustainable practices in the workplace. There's also a library of actual resources. Now we didn't actually build those libraries. What we did is we just leverage existing ones. So there's subject resources available in the United States, in Europe, in the UK and Australia. So we've got a directory there. That means we don't have to maintain those. They're maintained by somebody else. Um, and then finally, because we want to get sustainability as an example of their everyday life, not just their professions, We've got examples of how our various campuses can be used for sustainable practices. So if you look behind me, I've got a rammed earth mud wall uh, in my office. So we've got a sustainably designed cap campus, which uses very little water, uses solar energy and all those sort of things. So that's uh, the resources for online. The second thing we did is did something, I guess what Simon talked about, which is a bit similar, I forget the word he used, but we created champions in various schools so that they're local face-to-face -face mentors for people that might be in an unusual um, discipline such as uh, podiatry or chemistry or something like that, that they could go to and learn about, well, how do I implement sustainable practices into my subject? So that's the third key message. The fourth one is we supported the change by providing staff with training. So we've got ELMO. I don't know if people are familiar with ELMO, but it's a talent acquisition module that people do um, that, that has short tests and things like that. It's often for things such as 
intellectual property and stuff like that. But we've talked about implementing sustainability into the curriculum. Um, and everybody who is a new staff member, so if you're a new staff member coming to CSU, if you're a course director or a sub dean or an associate dean, you must do this so that you know that sustainability, uh, how to put sustainability into your degree. So they're the four key messages I have. One is it's a global, it's a graduate outcome. Two, we've got online resources. Three, we've got local support. And four, uh, we've got online training to build the capacity of staff that are actually implementing it. Um, and to conclude, look, I'm not gonna say that we're a miracle and that we've done absolutely everything perfect because um, curriculum change can be very difficult in a higher education institution. But I think we've had some successes by making the change easy with a range of support relevant to the particular roles they have and by making the change and how to implement it as relevant and contextualised as possible for the various disciplines that we uh, teach. Uh, look, it's been a really short presentation. If you need to get in contact with me, want to see some of the things that we've got, just email me at jhoward at csu.edu.au. And as Simon referred to, you look, you know, this thing is not done alone. It's done by sharing and resources and, and by a team approach. So uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And... Um... Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the, the champions. I've got some questions, uh, as I already said. Also, to having the sustainable campus and for the students to see uh, how things can uh, look in, uh, in reality is, uh, is, is really important too. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And especially around um, that we actually need to share the information. We don't need to do everything ourselves if we can really use what, uh, what others do to, uh, to, our, uh, yeah, to our benefit, but also to the benefit of the whole. So thank you for highlighting that point and sharing your experience. Um, the last panel member um, uh, that I would like to invite is um, Harsh Fury from uh, Deakin University. Um, over to you. Hi, I'm Harsh, Associate Professor Harsh Suri. So I'm from Beacon Learning Futures, which is which is like I'm a higher education researcher, but I support the Faculty of Business and Law. And together with me, I have Associate Professor Farah Azmat. So Farah and I together lead the prime initiatives in our faculty. Farah looks after the research and partnerships area, and I lead the curriculum integration aspect of it. And one of the things we found, like, you know, as a team effort, we found that to engage our academics more into it, we found that strengthening the nexus between teaching and research was quite powerful. So for example, if I'm, I was working with a colleague on SDG integration into her unit, and then she wrote back to me, you know what, I had an ARC category one grant interview, and then they asked me, what's the impact of your research? And I could talk about SDGs because you had worked with me in the curriculum. So we find often we try to build on those hooks. If somebody is already researching or if somebody is already doing something in the partnerships area, we encourage them to bring it back into their teaching. And it's very interesting because often people don't connect because they feel that students are not there yet. So we find that encouraging staff to kind of helping them understand that actually our students are asking for sustainability related in initiatives is quite useful. So at DBS, we started like in 2016, after the initial euphoria of SDGs, where I remember in the early conversations, almost everybody was talking about how many SDGs we integrate and how many units, and you know, the number of SDGs we have in our course, all those sorts of conversations were going on. I kind of got quite worried because I felt all that is doing is fostering surface approaches to learning. So, and, you know, a lot of, to be honest, a lot of initial impetus for business schools came from our international accreditation agencies, AACSB, Equus, and AMBA. And a lot of that was kind of big boxing, greenwashing was happening. So what my concern was, I wanted to engage students deeply and meaningfully, and not just in the elite boutique elective type of courses where we invest lots of resources, but I wanted to explore how can we engage most of our students. And one way of doing that I felt was a programmatic approach. Because when we use the whole of program approach, we can avoid curriculum crowding, we can avoid duplication. And also that meant that we could kind of contextualize it to different disciplines. So my focus has not been about how many SDGs are covered in a course, but rather having conversations with each course team about what SDGs are most relevant to your discipline, to your profession, and how are you ensuring 
that your students contribute to it. And it could not be, it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of contributing to SDGs, but also, you know, what are the SDGs that your discipline or profession is harming the most or hindering the most? So having those conversations with them. When I looked around 2015 and 2016, I started a participatory research synthesis. And at that time, because SDGs had just started, there wasn't much in that space. So I didn't have much to be guided about in terms of scaffolded approach to integrating in the whole of course. Most commonly used thing was UN's pillars of learning about knowing, doing, and being, which I find very useful because we don't just want our students to talk the talk, but we also wanted them to be able to walk the talk. So I drew upon that, but then at the same time, I felt, you know, it's not just about knowing, doing, and being, but doing something different, being something different. So I didn't want our students to just do repeat business as usual, but actually have that critical thinking, start contesting the status quo. And for that, I use the structure of observed learning outcomes taxonomy, solo taxonomy that almost all higher education researchers use. And I tried to develop a, I actually developed a three level framework. So at level one, what students do is they develop a relational, a multi-structural understanding of what are SDGs, what are the key sustainability issues, but also understanding it from multiple perspectives. So not just one perspective of these are the SDGs, this is kind of, you know, what's the sacred talk about it, but actually looking at it, what, is, what are SDGs from different nations perspective, from different people's perspective, from different groups perspective, different stakeholders perspectives. So that is at the knowing level at level one and, we, we try to include students at, say, in the fundamental units with different types of awareness relevant to that discipline. So we have got an SDG awareness module at a very basic level where we introduce students to all the SDGs so that they understand that, you know, addressing one SDG might mean making compromises on another SDG. What are the key challenges? And again, we try to contextualize it within the Australian thing. So, for example, when I was developing this module and I was talking to my team, a lot of things about, you know, issues about poverty, how it's manifested differently within the same family, who in the Australian populations are most affected by it, how within the same family you might have poverty being experienced differently by different members of the family. So those are the sorts of issues that we briefly look at the introductory level. Then we move on to this next level. And again, I was informed by critical pedagogies because I didn't want students to just take SDGs as given, but to be able to critique it. So the second level, we foster relational understanding about how do these SDGs relate to each other. We encourage students to apply a relational understanding of SDGs to case studies and also critiquing the contemporary normals. So it's not that all normals are the same. Some narratives or some rhetorics, you know, are getting more privileged than others and who has a powerful stake in, or who has a more powerful voice in the space and who doesn't and how do we change that? At the third level, we engage students and we try to engage them in creating new normals. So how can they contribute towards SDGs through transformative action? So we try to actually foster critical reflexivity for catalyzing action. And that is more related to the solo taxonomy's extended abstract level. Initially, yes, we had a lot of kind of pushback from academics because a lot of academics still saw SDGs and sustainability and ethics, social responsibility and sustainability as peripheral to the core business knowledge. So I still remember, and you know, I've talked to lots of colleagues at PRME forums and champions forums, where we get often pushbacks from colleagues saying, our students come to learn discipline knowledge, not realizing that actually the discipline itself has to change now and is changing now. So we found that to engage academics, we found teaching research nexus was very useful, but also something that Simon has said and all the other speakers today have said, is linking it strongly with the employability. So strengthening the nexus between employability and sustainability was a very key thing. So helping students like with lots of will opportunities with lots of other graduate learning outcomes. So what I did was I actually every time, because I was also leading a course enhancement project, which required us to make sure that all programs assess graduate learning outcomes. So the way we approached it was making sure that with all the graduate learning outcomes we explore how do these how do these kind of intersect with sustainable development goals with ethics social responsibility and sustainability so and we try to find contextualized solutions for that 
at the initial levels, I developed a framework and I developed a survey which kind of had practical examples of this is how you can integrate it at different levels. And if you want, I'd be happy to share with you that, uh, you know, the framework with you and also the Qualtrics survey. So if your school's getting started in this direction, you're more than welcome to use that. And I developed this framework more broadly for internationalization of curriculum strategy. So what I've been trying to do is consider any teaching and learning strategy, rather than trying to look at it in isolation, we see how does that intersect with ethics, social responsibility and sustainability agenda. Thank you so much, Harsh. And time is running, so. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for for um, for showing uh, the importance of lifting it uh, from uh, from yeah very diverse approach to uh, to the programmatic approach and uh, and how you have done that. And uh, I come back with some questions uh, in a minute. I would like to uh, invite our keynote speaker and uh, our panel members um, um, to reflect a little bit on uh, in the first uh, three. Um, uh, talks, we heard about um, the champions. Um, I saw online uh, at Melbourne University. I think they call them fellows. And in 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 each of the initiative, whether the whole of institution or maybe at a lower level, how has that been important? And and it sounds like a key in ingredient. Um, what has been uh, what? What has been uh, going well with that, but maybe what obstacles did you have to overcome before it really worked and people were not just a champion? Uh, Simon, can I start with you? I'm sure. And, uh, two things I would op offer as an observation. Um, first of all, we didn't just have champions who were sustainability champions. So I also had champions who were the innovative entrepreneurs, the future thinkers. So people who were, were leading on multiple fronts. So if someone didn't particularly resonate with one of the champions challenges, they had other challenges they could engage with. And if you think about the principles of sustainability, you could embed them under any one of those challenge areas that I thought about. So there's a, there's a thing around that. And also the champions aren't by themselves. They have a team of fellows who are seven or eight other academics who work on the subjects that might be within their particular domain. They have a team of three or four student partners on each of those particular projects. So we have the students and the followers outweigh the champions, outnumber the champions. So there's a, a large group. But the second thing I would do is, is, and someone once said this in the way he talked about graduate attributes, um, that the thing that makes that sort of framing of outcomes useful is not the framing of the outcome itself. It's that it's a starting point for a conversation, a critical conversation around curriculum. So we have empowered our champions who are discipline-based academics to lead critical conversations around the relationship between discipline epistemologies and this sort of other transdisciplinary epistemology. So it, it takes the sort of things that Harsh talked about in her framework and really says, well, how do you give those back to academics to lead with? Um, so I think there's a, there's a way you can think about these champions that is becomes quite complex beyond the, the, the title. Absolutely. Um, Jonathan, um, you highlighted this as well from, from your perspective. Yeah, I'm going to use my own uh, discourse about this, but I think it's very similar to Simon in that um, if you look at the, the way that you can do public participation, you can do inform, engage and consult at the far end, and frequently, if you have an expert in sustainability design, will come in and try and inform people, but they're not talking at the same discipline level or the same context, the same pedagogical foundations. So you need to have somebody localised who has expertise and can talk the language, uh, can deal with their everyday problems and, and stuff like that. And, and it's important that they get supported because they're also taking a leap. So these champions are taking a leap in what they're doing. They're moving out of their discipline content area. So you need to support them and have regular team meetings, build the team, and provide them with the information that they're, they're thirsting for. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for highlighting the importance of language yesterday. That was actually uh, something that came up as well, uh, the importance of uh, language uh, to go across and to speak the language of the disciplines. Uh, Kristen. 
uh, support Jonathan's comments in that really what we want is people around the table where key decisions are being made or changes are being made that have this lens for sustainability. So integrated across organisations. And I think also sometimes you see finger pointing, you know, if you, if you start higher, looking at so hierarchical issues with this problem um, in, you know, different directions. And I think one of the key things we looked at with the sustainability committee and I remember getting feedback going, oh, I'm not senior enough to be on this type of committee. And it's like, well, actually, we want people across all areas and, you know, across, um, you know, all disciplines and everything else. So I think that that really represent different operational aspects of the business. So I think that that's really critical. And, um, you know, the people and identifying the people that have that passion and that drive want the experience, want to create change. It's a really, it's a win-win for everyone involved. Yeah, and thank you, thank you, Kristen, for for highlighting. You want to have it at all levels at, and all uh, across all areas. And I know that we did it with one of our faculties through a hackathon where everyone could uh, come in. And maybe I would like to invite uh, the audience to share some ways that they are trying to go about inviting uh, uh, everyone. Um, Harsh, I would like to pick up on the point that Simon just raised about the critical conversations. Um, how easy or how difficult was it actually to engage in those critical conversations? That's a very good point because, you know, I used, yes, I did use a survey initially where I provided some impetus for thought. So it had practical examples and we got about 160 colleagues of who were unit chairs of core units in our programs to reflect on how they were you know, integrating SDGs or ERS, ethics, social responsibility and sustainability into their curriculum, how they were assessing it, at what level were they doing it. But rather than that mapping exercise being an end in itself, that became a kind of trigger for further conversations. So after, and one of the things that I found really useful was I never presented myself as an expert because I'm anyway a high education researcher rather than a management discipline expert or, you know, from business disciplines, I was always able to position myself as a, as a kind of curious colleague who knows something, but who doesn't know everything. So when I asked colleagues, does this sound relevant? And I'm the outsider, like you're the expert in this. Often what I found was they were able to own those changes and they were quite happy. The second thing was rather than presenting SDGs as part of the problem, because, you know, in my role, I often have to ask colleagues or when I'm leading strategic initiatives, I have to say, you need to do this. Rather than that, we have offered SDGs as a solution to part of the problem. So, for example, somebody came to me and said that, you know what, I'm supposed to be assessing graduate learning outcome self-management, but I'm not quite doing it. And that's when I would get that in. How about doing it this way? Or, you know, any other graduate learning critical thinking I need to assess and then start slightly gently move into it. So offering SDGs as part of a solution was something I felt helped them get traction to it. Yeah, thank you. And what I pick up there, it's the evidence-based and the ownership that, uh, that you've created. And Simon, I'm, I'm curious to, to, to hear um, how, how you went about creating the ownership for this whole new institutional agenda. And maybe it's a much bigger question around what were the key ingredients that that drove this but what did you have to overcome at at your level to get this going well, that is a very big question and there are some colleagues on the screen who would know some of the background to this jen and, and jonathan i suppose um, there are a range of things that i think you need to think about at an institutional level some of it is about just surfacing what is already there so you know as a university we had a deep history of research and commitment in pockets to sustainability all we needed to do was surface that and make it visible and apparent. You need to think about what drives universities and, and what drives people like me and my, my colleagues in the senior executive group. Um, and, you know, we have a commitment to the values and the mission of the university that is also tempered by what I call the competitive streak. Um, so things like the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, we jumped on as an opportunity. Uh, I mean, the first time we went into them, we had no idea how we were going to go, of course. It was a bit of a gamble. Um, and we, you know, we did say this could be terrible, it could backfire. But it was a way of actually mobilising and bringing to the surface all the work we did. And we then had a very good result, of course, um, which meant that suddenly people were interested in this for a range of different reasons. So you, you play to different motivations. But the other thing I would talk to is, is probably the way we have gone about building our decadal strategy, the sustainability and resilience strategy. 
And we built that around some consultation with colleagues that really was genuinely about contesting all of the complex ideas that were going to come to the surface in trying to write any sort of single document, not only that was about sustainability now, but was about sustainability for the next decade. Um, and you can imagine some of the debates that surfaced. And it was about being willing to stay with those debates and think about how you then create something that is a living document that won't just sit on a shelf. And, and the document that we have developed has, as the second part of it, an engagement framework that sort of invites our colleagues to look at those priority statements and say, well, what are you doing in your space that might be relevant with this? How would you set some intermediate horizon targets that you might want to work to? And how would you tell us about them as a way of us building a new institutional narrative about what we are doing? So we've designed this intentionally so that it is owned by the community, um, our university community. And that, that's very different. It, it almost takes the frameworks that Jen's talked about, about how you involve different partners at different levels to a completely new level. And it is that notion of partnership pedagogy, a genuine commitment to before you even think about an idea, thinking about it with someone. So it's, it's a new way of working that I'm finding really resonates with my colleagues. I love it. Um, anyway, we can talk about more about that later. Thank you. Yeah, and, 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 and I love the, the passion there, but the building of the partnerships, we, we often think about it externally, but it's so important to create change uh, in, internally. Um, how has that been of importance uh, for the other speakers, the creation of the, the partnerships to, uh, to make happen uh, what you're doing or the success of what you're doing? Um, I might have a crack at this one, if I may. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to totally answer your question because uh, I've got three points. One is uh, it's important that the entire university walks the walk. So, and I'm not just talking about different uh, schools or faculties, I'm talking about on campus, about its purchasing decisions and all that sort of stuff. So it pervades, it's an ethos throughout the entire system. So that's the, the first point I have to say. I'm gonna echo some of Simon's points about awards. I think we entered the Times Education uh, awards. Uh, I think we got 61 in our first effort, which we thought was outstanding at the time. We've also been involved in the Green Gant Awards, um, both internationally and in Australia, and that's been um, a major promotion amongst staff and the, the entire campus saying, hey, we're, we're on a winner here. So that's good. Um, and then down to the, the um, more local level, I guess, where I'm sometimes in the operational level, there's two things that really get my goat um, in terms of barriers. One is accreditation. Um, I get so many conversations from people who have an accredited degree, like it might be vet science or something, and I'm not trying to pick them out individually. And they say, oh, we can't do this because it's an accredited degree, we have to follow accreditation. But then when you look at these various disciplined professionals, you'll see that vet science has, the association has things about sustainability or nursing has the same thing about sustainability. Um, and that's just a false argument. So we have to overcome that as one of the barriers. The other one is about the understanding about what sustainability is. I've had people in policing or emergency management saying, well, I'm not going to teach them about rainforest or I'm not going to teach them about saving the whales. Um, and you say, well, wait a minute, it's about um, crime and in natural environments, the way you said an environment. It's about gender equity, about um, alleviating poverty, all these other things. Um, and to my mind, they're the two things that get my goat. Now, I've been quite specific, but it relates back to some themes that other people have said. It's about creating a common ground between somebody who's interested in sustainability and somebody who's a discipline expert. And, and that's the way you've got to approach it. It's about creating a common language, a common ground, appreciation of both what you, what one person needs and the other person needs. Thank you. I can offer a different perspective because I've been leading from the margins. So I don't think I have the power to create a common language at this stage. But what I found useful was, yes, Green Gowns Awards and things like that definitely do support a big time. So, you know, pre-Green Gowns Award and post-Green Gowns Award, our faculty's engagement just changed drastically. So I think I'm very grateful for those sorts of things. But then, at the end, yes, accreditation bodies are a good initial hook. But I think we also, as a collective mass, need to start challenging some of those assumptions with accreditation bodies. So for example, you know, the inequities that are there, like with the accreditation bodies, if you look at the business ones, they are, if you are involved in a global experiential learning related to ethics, social responsibility, and sustainability, that's the global standard. But 
there are lots of equity issues because we know students from equity issue groups cannot actually engage in lots of those global mobility programs. So thinking outside the box, we've started creating global you know, virtual will programs so that students can engage in global programs more virtually rather than having to travel because they just don't have the resources to do that. The second thing is, I think, actually engaging with the lived realities of students. So we try to pick up issues in a very abstract sense, but why not look at our own backyard? We know we've got a large proportion of international students who are victims of modern slavery. But seldom are we willing to be brave enough to actually address that in our class and to openly discuss it, to openly discuss the inequities that we are creating within our own higher education system. So I think the more honest we are, the more open we are. And yes, we don't have solutions to all the problems. But if we are brave enough to address them more openly, I hope that we can make our students more critically reflexive who would be able to transform things. And off Thank the back you, of what, so, sorry, Annette. Go ahead, Kirsten. Yeah, just briefly off the back of what um, Hosh was just saying, I think um, the one of the misconceptions we've seen is the perception that the SDGs are for lower developmental index countries or aren't as relevant to life here in Australia, which really doesn't appreciate the inter you know, the global um, environment that we're part of now and also some of these inequities that um, others are talking about that are happening in our communities, you know, all of the time that we need to be addressing. So that's been the sort of, a, I guess, an area that's really important to have dialogue around. And also I think you're talking about sort of collaborations, sometimes working with other groups to then, you know, bring some of those issues to the forefront can be really important in addressing these problems. And another thing I think I've seen that's been an interesting challenge, and I've got I could list off a gazillion challenges, and thankfully lots of them have been discussed, but um, it's really just the attitude behaviour gap. So a lot of people do believe these things are important, um, but then their actions may not, you know, may not um, show that. Or you know, we're all in busy schedules, we've got conflicting priorities, and so it just isn't um, brought to the forefront. And I think. Again, working with different groups can be really important. So I might not have as much buy-in from the student community, but when I'm working with students who are part of an environmental club and they're working with the student community, you know, we can get more sort of leverage and, and a lot more excitement around and movement around these issues. Thank you. Th thank you um, for, yeah, for highlighting these challenges. Uh, we nearly, we nearly at the time. And uh, before I summarize uh, some of what we said, Simon, uh, just for a closing comment, back to you. Um, we um, uh, we are still in the middle of uh, COVID. Maybe for us it feels a bit different than other parts in the world, but it's a rea uh, uh, reality, and it's a reality for our uh, universities. Um, what next? What needs to be done in this in this current climate? For, uh, for the universities drawing on your experience? That's a very good question and I wish I knew the answer. Um, I mean, I think, I think when you are surrounded by cascading crises, you start to think about what lets you survive cascading crises. And I think that is about understanding what makes an institution truly resilient and sustainable. So I think the what next is actually about how you preserve the sustainability of higher education institutions as value-driven forces for change in society. I think there is a real need for universities to work out how to return to what they should be doing. Um, and I think that is a, an interesting thing to do in the midst of the current reform agenda around higher education, um, but one that I think has never been more important than ever. We need to actually tell people what it is we do and what we can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, um, that closing comment. And um, yeah, it is, it, it's, it's providing our value to society and especially with, uh, with, uh, with all the challenges we face. Um, I really want to thank you all. And um, a, a lot has been said, and I just want to come to a couple of things in different ways, the importance of the champions and maybe having very diverse champions. 
incentives and what role they can play and what I actually heard maybe from the individual to the institutional level, um, bringing the lived experiences in and maybe our universities are spaces uh, for living labs and they need to be that more and more. And um, I think we can see in the sector some great examples of that. And we need to continue with uh, challenging um, the perspectives on SD and um, um, close the gap between the attitudes and, the, and behaviors. And that really requires us to draw on different disciplines on you know, behavioral change. How, how can we actually do that, et cetera? Thank you all so much for the conversation. Simon, uh, Kristen, Jonathan, and Harsh, really thank you. And um, yeah. Over um, to uh, to Belinda. Thanks, Annette. Um, wow. What, how, how do I how do I follow that 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 panel? Um, I would yeah just again um, personally like to thank our chairs and our speakers um, from both yesterday um, and today. Not only for giving us your time and your perspective on on some critical areas, but also for walking the talk. Um, you are all extremely passionate and yeah, it's a really just an honor to, to listen to you and, and your experiences. And thank you to everyone who's popping links, um, information in the chat. It's, it's, it's a really excellent discussion and I hope we get to collaborate more and, and as we share, as we share these resources.